This competition is one of my absolute favorite parts of being CEO of the council. The other part, of course, being having lunch with my board chair. Uh, so I'd like to tell you just about, that was a joke, <laughs> a little one. So I'd like to tell you just a little bit about the work that we do and why this is so important. Economics is not just a theoretical or abstract subject. It's about how the world works, how our students will make their way in the world, and it's actually about making the world a better place for more of us. You want clean energy technologies? How do you finance their development? You want to lift people out of poverty? How will tax or trade policies help or hinder? You want philanthropy? Well, I think you all know where you should be starting with that one. But incredibly, one of the world's greatest economies does very little to teach us, and our students especially, about how to survive and thrive in it. And that's where CE comes in. The 11,000 students in the US who competed here, competed, uh, represent just a few of the students, just a few thousand of the students in grade, grades K through 12 that are served by our programs. And of course, by the truly remarkable teachers that we train. What do we do? Quite simply, everything. We build the educational resources that teachers need and want, including workbooks, online resources, interactive lessons, lesson plans. We provide training in those resources. We devise effective, innovative programs to get these subjects into the classroom and into communities, such as our Never Too Young After School program through K-5, or math in the real world. And we campaign at the state and federal levels to get standards adopted and requirements passed an endeavor that's served by our biennial publication, The Survey of the States, which analyzes the progress, or unfortunately lack of it, in every state. Our new edition is hot off the press. In short, the council does the research, build the material, builds the materials, does the politics, and trains the teachers here in New York City and across the nation through our state affiliates. At the end of the day, we arrive here. Our student, dis our student competitors have gained discipline, exposure, and confidence. Some of the students who competed around the country had never been on a college campus before where they had their finals. Some of the students who come to their local finals or even to the nationals have never been on an airplane or out of their home states. And all of our students had the chance to meet their peers and experience what it takes to excel. I saw the analytical thinking rounds yesterday for some of the teams and it was pretty impressive. They also, for many of you, are seeing New York City for the first time and meeting financial professionals for the first time. And the very best, especially for our US students, is to get a chance to meet their peers from China. This is the second year of our remarkable partnership with SKT Education in China, led by Houston Hu and his vice president, Zha Zha Dong, is here today as well. This is largely due to Houston and Jaja's incredible energy and dedication, and we're very fortunate to have them as our partner. Last month, I was fortunate enough to visit CE's National Economics Challenge China, the semifinals in Shanghai. I spoke to so many students and teachers. Their enthusiasm was so unbounded, inspiring, and contagious, and the dumplings were excellent. I am overjoyed to have these students here with us today, and I'm so pleased that we have a chance to reciprocate the warmth to them that they showed to me when I was visiting. C is also a champion here, I must say. Over our long history, nearly 70 years, we've ensured that the specialized language of economics, one that bridges nations, is taught to our kids because it is a language for navigating the real world and creating a better one. With this knowledge, students can build a sturdy hope, a sturdy hope for a good life on whichever horizon line they choose. I think that our founders would be pleased. This is a tremendous accomplishment for all of you and I'd like to give you all and ask all, you to, all of you to give each other a tremendous round of applause. <laughs> Welcome to Council for Economic Education's 2018 National Economics Challenge. For 18 years, the Economics Challenge has become a proven motivator for students and teachers across America. One, two, three, keep on! Each year, over 11,000 students from nearly every state compete. This year, 
the top eight teams came to New York City, and this weekend, they completed in the final grueling rounds to determine the top two teams from each division. The David Ricardo Division, with teams of students who have taken no more than one introductory economics course. And the Adam Smith Division, teams enrolled in AP, IB, and Honors Economics classes. Now, the top two teams in each division face off in the nail-biting final quiz bowl round, fighting for the chance to be crowned the Council for Economic Education's 2018 National Economics Champions. Now, here's the President and CEO of the Council for Economic Education, Nan Morrison. Thanks everyone. Our competition is really now about to start. Thanks all for being here. First, I want to acknowledge our Board of Director, our donors who are here, some of you, and some special guests. Special call out to Board Member Russell Glass who sponsors the Adam Smith Individual Achievement Award. We'll be giving that later to Schwartzman Scholars, Bob Garris, Bloomberg Sarah Booth, and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. We thank you for your support. And of course, the great work of John Palacio and the Anna crew and Rick, our wonderful stage manager, and CNBC, Steve, Haley, Rich, the rest of the crew, some of whom I got a chance to meet this morning. You all do a wonderful job, and we could not be more thrilled to, to have, you here, have you all here with us today. I also want to acknowledge SKT Education Group, our exclusive partner in China, their CEO, Houston Hugh, and their Vice President, Zha Zha Dong. SK, SKT brought 64 student competitors here from China, and we are thrilled to welcome them here to New York. Having attended the competitions in China, I'm really looking forward to that last round today. I won't tell you if I'm going to root for the US teams or the Chinese teams. I want to extend, again, a thank you to all of our judges for donating their time, as well as to the teachers who worked so hard to get their students here. And of course, last but certainly not least, my own amazing staff who have been working so hard every day, it seems like 24 by 7, for at least the last two weeks, if not longer. My thanks would not be complete if I didn't give another shout of gratitude to Steve Leisman, CNBC's senior economics reporter, who is our guest host for the afternoon. You've seen him on Squawk Box this morning at 6.45 with the NEC students, Power Lunch, Nightly Business Report. He is literally on the box from dawn until dusk. And remember, it's summer, so dusk is very late these days. Steve has won both an Emmy and a Pulitzer. But my favorite thing about Steve is that he's a serious deadhead, plays guitar in two bands. They are fantastic. I have been to their concerts. So you see, you can still do economics and rock out. Steve, thanks so much for everything that you and your team do. And I'd like to welcome you to the stage and pass the baton to you. Thank you so much, Nan. You're welcome. Big round of applause for Nan who puts all this together. Right on. All right. I was thinking about like when I was in high school, I didn't do economics, I did football. So it's like, how do you prepare for a football game? Let's everybody stand up. Everybody stand up. Come on, stand up. Everybody start clapping. Turn the person next to you, big high five. Let's get this challenge going. There we go. I wish them well. That's great. Okay, now we can do this. Got to get the blood flowing, folks. OK. OK, it says let's get this competition started. OK. It's OK. It's all right to scream out and, 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 and whoop it up a little bit. That's cool. All right, so the students have already completed three testing rounds and a critical thinking round. And these two teams made it to today's final David Ricardo Quiz Bowl round and are competing for the title of national champion. We're going to start with the David Ricardo division, which includes teams of students who have taken no more than one introductory economics course. Before we bring out the two finalists in the division, I want to introduce the judges for all of today's final quiz bowl rounds. And I have to tell you that I thought last year the script was big enough for me not to use my glasses. I've lost that battle. <laughs> Here we go. You guys will know what I'm talking about in sooner than you know. 
All right, first we have Kristen Dickey, the former head of global, global head of strategy for index equity at BlackRock. Michael Ekstut, founding, founder and managing principal of MKE Bios Bioservices. Larry Cantor, former managing director and head of global research at Barclays Capital. All right. And on the next page, the core judges are Stephen Buckles, Stephen Buckles, right? Stephen. Stephen, right. He's a senior lecturer in economics at a school you all want to get into, Vanderbilt University. Julie Heath, Director of Economics Center, Professor at Alpal, Family Chair in Economics, University of Cincinnati. <laughs> Colonel Dick Rankin, former award-winning NEC coach at Iolani High School. Iolani. Iolani. <laughs> Not as bad as when I did mispronounce choke here. I've got worse to come, don't you worry about it. Jane Lopez, Director, Center for Economic Education, California State University, East Bay. All right, here's the deal. Our judges are responsible for confirming our contestants' responses, and they're gonna have the final say on the accuracy of an answer. Thank you, judges, for your support and for being here today. Now I wanna call the teams to the stage. Now let's give a round of applause to the top two teams in the David Ricardo Division, help me welcome the finalists in the David Ricardo Division is Hunter College High School, New York. And the second finalist, Monte Vista High School, California. Okay, congratulations guys. Welcome to the 2018 National Economics Challenge, David Ricardo Championship Round. All right, now pay attention. Here are the competition rules. Whoever buzzes in for a question will be considered the team spokesperson for that particular question and must give the final answer. Team members may buzz in at any time while the question is being read, however, should they buzz in before the entire question has been read, I will stop reading the question. The team may not confer, and within five seconds, the person who buzzed in must answer based solely on the information he or she has heard up to that point. If a team member buzzes in after the entire question is read, the team has 15 seconds to confer and then give a response. You got that? I got it. You got it? I got it. That's what I want to hear. <laughs> If the team answers incorrectly, I'll read the entire question again. The other team will have 15 seconds to respond, and any team member can give the final answer. How about you guys over here? You got it? Got it. No, no, answer the microphone. We got it. All right, that's good. All right. Audience members, I encourage you to call out the answer. No, no, just kidding. Do not call out the answer. You probably don't even, well, some of you guys will. Anyway, I encourage you to root for all your favorite teams, but please do not shout any answers out. Before we begin, I'd like to give the two teams the opportunity to introduce themselves. Starting at the far end, would each of you test your hand buzzer one at a time? Tell me your name and something about yourself. Please be sure to speak loudly. Starting from the far end, which way are we starting? Over here? Go ahead. Into the microphone. My name is Daniel Buschak. Uh, I love studying computer science, math, economics, and uh, I love weightlifting as well. <laughs> uh, my name is Alan Weisbord. I'm from Queens. I also enjoy weightlifting, uh, running track, playing soccer, and I speak Russian fluently. <laughs> Hi, my name is Andrew Conkey. Uh, I'm from Manhattan on the west side. Uh, I enjoy all types of economics, but I'm particularly interested in uh, applications of math to economics and I do not enjoy weightlifting. <laughs> Start back on that end, over there. Hi, I'm Pranav Srinivasan, and I like working with AI and advanced technologies. And weights. <laughs> no. Hi, I'm Rahul Amara. I'm on my high school's uh, robotics team. 
Hello, I'm Adamya Shrivastava, and I play basketball very vigorously. <laughs> Hi, I'm Vishal Sodem, and I have run eight half marathons. We're going to start the questioning right away. Question number one. Fred lost his job as a shipbuilder in 2016. His, ship, his shipyard never reopened, and his specialized skills are no longer in demand. Mana Vista, you have five seconds, Mr. Vishal, to answer. Uh, structural unemployment. That is correct. <laughs> All right. That's totally unfair for people at home that are watching on TV. I'm going to read the full question so you know this guy. All right, so he, the shipyard never reopened. His specialized skills are no longer in demand. Fred is experiencing what kind of unemployment, and it is structural unemployment for regular human beings, okay? <laughs> here we go. On to the second question here. If the required reserve ratio is 10% and the Fed buys a $5,000 bond from a bank, what is the maximum change to the money supply? Monta Vista High School, Mr. Vishal, you have 15 minutes and you may confirm. 15 seconds and you may confirm. $4,500. That is incorrect. Steve. Okay, I'll read the question again. If the required reserve ratio is 10% and the Fed buys a $5,000 bond from a bank, what is the maximum change to the money supply? $50,000. That's correct. That is correct. Well done. All right. Here's another question. Third question. Why does a professional basketball player, on average, Make more than a professional football or Bona Vista High School, Adama, Adam, yeah, you have uh, five seconds and you may not confirm. Uh, the, bas the professional basketball player, uh, his skill is in more demand than other players of sports. That's correct. All right, well done. Okay, for the next question, we have a video question. Four members of the Federal Open Market Committee vote on a rotating basis. How long is each rotating? Monta Vista High School, Raul, you have five seconds and you may not confer. Uh, they'll rotate every one year. Yes, that's right. You answered so quickly, we didn't have a chance to introduce. That was Raphael Bostock, the president of the Atlanta Federal Reserve Bank. Thank you, Raphael. Okay, on to question five. Why do we not see advertisements for corn, but we do for toothpaste? Hunter, uh, Andrew, you have five, you have 10 seconds, 15 seconds. excuse me, 15 <coughs> seconds to respond and you may confer. Uh, because the market structure of the corn market is perfect competition, and the market structure of the toothpaste market is monopolistic competition. That is correct. On the, hey, Chris, can we get a score? Yeah, sure. After five questions, it's uh, Monta Vista 3, Hunter 2. Ooh, tight, tight. There we go. Question number six. A group of Fortune 500 companies have formed an alliance to explore the smart... Mm -hmm. Excuse me, Hunter High School. Andrew, uh, you have five seconds. You may not confer. Uh, oligopoly. No, I'm sorry. That's incorrect. Please read the question again, Steve. Yes, ma'am. A group of Fortune 500 companies have formed an alliance to explore the smart contract blockchain technology developed by what cryptocurrency company? Ethereum? That's correct. Wow. All right. 
Question seven. Contributions to the Social Security system are achieved by levying a tax of 6.2% on earnings up to $128,700. What kind of tax is this? Hunter, Alan, you have five seconds. You may not confer. Is that not the whole question? Okay. Uh, progressive tax? Nope, sorry. Steve, will you repeat it? Yes, ma'am. Contributions to the Social Security system are achieved by levying a tax of 6.2% on earnings up to $128,700. What kind of tax is this? Regressive, proportional, or progressive? Regressive. That is correct. Well done. And for question eight, we have another Federal Reserve Bank video question. Which interest rate is charged by depository institutions when... Hunter, Andrew, you have five seconds. You may not confer. Uh, the federal funds rate? That is correct. You guys just don't like Raphael Bostock on the video, right? You just <laughs> buzz it in. Poor Raphael. Going for a little airtime? Can't get any from you guys. All right, here we go. Question nine. If cauliflower is an inferior good and we observe that as the price falls, consumers buy fewer. Um, it is a given good, so as uh, price uh, increases, consumption quantity of the good purchased uh, decreases. Sorry, that's incorrect. Okay, from the top. If cauliflower is an inferior good and we observe that as the price falls, consumers buy fewer heads of cauliflower, then what can we say about the relative size of the income effect and the substitution effect? Uh, the income effect is larger in this case than the substitution. That's right. Thank you. Chris? Yeah, sure. We're nine questions in, and Montevist is up uh, six to three. Six to three. Still very competitive. Question 10. To minimize the efficiencies associated with taxation, the demand and supply curve should exhibit what sort of elasticities? Hunter High School, uh, <coughs> Alan, you have 15 seconds. You may confer. Relatively inelastic. Uh, yeah. That is correct. All right. Question 11. If the consumer price index is 120 in year one and 150 in year two, the rate of inflation over the period is what? Monta Vista High School, Michelle, you have 15 seconds. You may Twenty-five percent. That's correct. All right. Question twelve. What is one of the main differences between the GDP deflator and the CPI? Monta Vista High School, Michelle, you have fifteen seconds. You may confer. CPI is measured like a basket of goods, tracking their prices over time, while the GDP deflator is just measured uh, relative to a base year's GDP. Sorry, that's incorrect. Okay. What is one of the main differences between the GDP deflator and the CPI? Uh, 
the GDP deflator only looks at final goods, whereas the market basket, basket in CPI contains some uh, intermediate goods. Reflecting the economy. Correct. The correct answer is that the CPI will include imports, or the GDP includes all purchases of goods, not just those purchased by consumers. Okay. Moving on. It's okay to get both of both of you guys get it wrong. It's all right. It's all right. We're going to move on from here. Pick ourselves up. Get one right here. The question thirteen. The unemployment rate falls. What could explain this other than? An increase in individuals. They buzz, they buzz. He rang, he rang I didn't hear that. Yep. Sorry. Monta Vista, Vishal, you have five seconds. Answer. Answer, please. I'm sorry. So that was, we're it's moving wrong. on now? It's wrong. Reread the question for the other team. Okay. The unemployment rate falls. What could explain this, other than an increase in individuals becoming employed? An increase in the number of discouraged workers. That's correct. Let's do a score check. Uh, after 13 questions, we have Monta Vista 7, Hunter College High School 5. Good. And we're going to 31 would be the tiebreaker, so it's 30 questions. It's 30 questions, yes. Okay. Question 14. Assume that neither demand nor supply is perfectly elastic or inelastic. As the result of a changing market, we observe that prices increase, but quantity exchanged has not changed. What accounts for this outcome? Um, yes, that's Hunter College. You have 15 seconds. Andrew, you may confer. Uh, there was a decrease in supply and an increase in demand. Yes, that's right. Okay, question 15. Autonomous expenditure is the amount of spending individuals would engage in at what level of income? Uh, Hunter College, Allen, five seconds. At the uh, sustenance level? Sorry, that's incorrect. Okay, question 15. Autonomous expenditure is the amount of spending individuals would engage in at what level of income? the subsistence level. That's incorrect. The correct answer is zero. Okay. Question 16. What is the economic difference between a quota and an embargo? I can't see it. Oh, sorry. Monta Vista, Raul, you have uh, 15 seconds. You may confer. An embargo is a complete block on trade to a country, while quota it just caps the amount. Great, perfect. Good. <laughs> Question 17. When a monop monopolist is forced to produce at the allocatively efficient point, what two curves it? The Hunter High School, Alan, you have five seconds. The intersection of demand and average total cost. That's incorrect. When a monopolist is forced to produce at the allocatively efficient point, what two curves intersect? Uh, the marginal cost and demand. 
That's correct. <laughs> Question 18. All football goalposts have flags at the top so the kicker knows which way the wind is blowing. What economic concept is illustrated by indoor stadiums also having these flags on the goalposts? Monta Vista High School, Rao, you have 15 seconds. You may confer. Imitation? No, that's incorrect. <clears throat> Question 18. All football goalposts have flags at the top so the kicker knows which way the wind is blowing. What economic concept is illustrated by indoor stadiums also having these flags on the goalposts? No, 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 no. Market failure. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice try, but it's economies of scale. It's cheaper to produce one kind than multiple kinds. After 18 questions, the score is Monte Vista 9, Hunter 6. 9 to 6, here we go. Um, oh, sorry, okay. Question 19, correct? Okay. Question 19, if the opportunity cost of producing either of two goods is constant, then the production possibility for... Uh, you, Daniel, you have five seconds, you may not confer. Is linear and not bowed out? Yep, yep that's correct. Wanna read that one? Read the whole one? If yes, the opportunity cost of producing either of two goods is constant, then the production possibility frontier is of what shape? The answer is straight line or linear? Notice how Alice Trebek always says the answers if he knows it all along. <laughs> he also gives it in a way that's like, uh, how did you not know that? But I don't feel that way at all. <laughs> 20, what is the difference between the concepts balance of trade and current account balance? Monta Vista, Adam, you have 15 seconds, you may confer. Um, the balance of payments includes the current account, financial account and capital account, while the current account itself just looks at countries' net imports and exports? No. That's incorrect. What is the difference between the concepts, quote, balance of trade, end quote, and current account balance? Um, the current account includes net investment. <coughs> we'll take it. <laughs> we are at nine to eight. Uh, we've, we're 20 questions in, 10 to go. Here we go. In production theory, what distinguishes the short run from the long run? Hunter High School, Alan, you have five seconds. Uh, the capacity to uh, change your factories and workers. That's incorrect. Okay, 21. In production theory, what distinguishes the short run from the long run? I 
didn't think he said run. Yeah, I thought you sure. hit it long. <coughs> you were early. You were early. It was in the middle of run when you buzzed it. There are no fixed costs, and all costs are very. In, uh, in the long run, there are no fixed costs, and all costs are variable. That's correct. That's correct. Question twenty-two: What function of money is associated with the purchase of a latte? Monta Vista. Adam, you have five seconds. Medium of exchange. That's correct. And you didn't know if, if I wanted skim or 1% of that, you just were going to buzz in. It wouldn't matter if it was like with, uh, you know, Splenda or regular sugar. It's still a medium of exchange. Doesn't change the answer. The question was what function of money is associated with the purchase of a latte with cash or a debit card? I didn't say Starbucks or pizza or whatever. Anyway, question 23. According to the, to the classical economists, what is the most appropriate stabilization? Hunter College, a Alan, you have five seconds. Uh, the invisible, Adam Smith's notion of the invisible hand, uh, do nothing basically, that's it. That's it. Full question, according to the classical economist, what is the most appropriate stabilization policy during recessionary periods? Question 24, how will real GDP in the United States be affected if the price of crude oil rises significantly? Hunter College, Alan, you have 15 seconds, you may confer. It would go down? Yep. That's correct. We're at 11 to 10. Uh, 11 we're now, to 10. 11 to 10, we're at question 25. Wow. Question 25. Since the early 1900s, real GDP per capita in the United States has grown at what average annual rate? Hunter High School. Alan, you have 15 seconds. You may confer. Three percent? Incorrect. Question 25. Since the early 1900s, real GDP per capita in the United States has grown at what average annual rate to the nearest whole number? That's incorrect. The correct answer is 2%. A lot of politics around that answer there, aren't there? <laughs> we don't want to get into those, right, Nan? Never mind. Okay, question 26. I love this question. Only economists could ask this next question. The hurricanes of late 2017 likely caused what change in the short run Phillips curve? Monta Vista, well, you have 15 seconds, you may confer. And the Phillips curve expanded outwards. That's correct. Would have also accepted the Phillips curve got blown out to sea, but that's another one. <laughs> Question 27. What is the organization that oversees global trade negotiations? Hunter College. Andrew, you have five seconds. You may not confer. The World Trade Organization? That's correct. Okay. We are at 12.11, and we have three questions remaining. Wow. Oh. <laughs> 
What is the name of the UN agreement addressing, among other things, greenhouse gas emissions? Monta Vista, Vishal, you have five seconds. You may not confer. The uh, Paris, the Treaty of Paris Climate Agreement. We'll give it to you. Is it the Paris Accords? It is, it is the Paris Climate Accord. Okay, so we are at 1311 with two questions remaining. That's such a big deal. The Treaty of Paris is in reference to the, the peace deal that ended the Spanish American War. It, well, I, I think. He said, he said the Treaty of Paris and he said the Paris climate. So that's why we gave it to him. Right. Right, yeah. Chris, is my math right? This would be for the win here? Uh, yes, we have two questions remaining, and we're at 1311. Larry, how about the sophisticated math I just did right there on stage, right? Public. <laughs> Question 29. If two goods are complements, what do we know about their cross? Hunter College High School. Andrew, you may not confer. It's negative. Correct. All right. What's the score here now? The score is Monta Vista 13, Hunter College High School 12, and we have our last uh, regulation question now. So this is also for the win. This is for the win or for the tie. Winner for the tie. Okay, question 30. So nervous, I can't even read it. <laughs> oh my God. If a perfectly competitive firm is operating where price is less than average total costs. Manavisha, Adam, you have five seconds. Uh, assuming that it's also less than average variable cost, it should shut down. Can you repeat your answer? The beeper got in the way. I didn't hear you. It should shut down. That's incorrect. Oh. Steve, why don't we read the question one more time? I think that's a really good idea. <laughs> OK. If a perfectly competitive firm is operating where price is less than average total costs and price is greater than average variable costs, what should it do? It should decrease production. It's like you bear the, the <laughs> it's like better than shutting down. Sorry, it's incorrect. We have a final score of 13-12, Monta Vista High School. Congratulations. Chris? What is the correct answer? So it'd be oh, correct. Here's, the, here's the correct answer, just so everybody knows. Continue to operate in the short run, even though there's an economic loss. I like bear the, it's like better than shutting down. <laughs> it's like part of my answer. It's like part of the answer. You, because it's more, it's more economically efficient to, to bear the cost. So our, our, our judges have ruled, and the final score is Monta Vista 13, Hunter College High School 12. Congratulations to Monta Vista High School. Okay. Um, hold on, Dan. Dan, hold on. It says applause there. It says applause. <laughs> Guys, great job.